thank you. Thank you for being here. And thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Um, so I'll talk about, so this, this work is joint with Hugo Duminil Copin and Vincent Tassion, who give the lecture. Um, and two other people, Maxime Gagnébin and Matan Arel, we were all uh, um, in, in a group in Geneva when we worked on this, mostly. So um, it's very linked to what's presented in the, um, in the course, and hopefully uh, you'll, you'll see the links. I should also say that um, I realize that it's quite a difficult subject, and uh, it's, you'll see it's, it's a long uh, talk with many ideas that, that come into play. So. What I propose is that we go as far as we can. There will be several steps where you'll see arguments that may be helpful to you. And then if we go to the end, that's good. If we don't, don't, that's also good. And if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt. Or if you want details on stuff, the, the point here is not to understand the proofs in detail. If you have one details, you can always come and see me afterwards, and I can give you more details. So let me uh, first present and explain to you what a first and second order phase transition is, and more generally what a phase transition is. Uh, you might recognize these pictures if you've been to uh, Hugo's colloquium to talk. Maybe I'll have time to comment on what they are. So uh, we're going to work here. Um, the setting is Z2, the square lattice, which we've seen uh, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the talk, in the lectures. Um, I'm always going to be in two dimensions. So we stick to two dimensions, and we'll define a percolation model, which is called FK percolation, that uh, Vincent's also going to work on uh, tomorrow. So it be a percolation model it means that you look at open or closed, say, edges, and that's what's interesting to you are connections. That's what really defines percolation. So we've seen a, a model uh, which was the regular called Bernoulli percolation where edges are independently open or closed with probability p. Now physically, in the, if you take them independently, somehow that makes the model very easy to study or easier to study. But physically, it's interesting to have dependence. Um, and it turns out that the natural way of introducing dependence is the following. So if you have a configuration of open and closed edges, you will assign a weight to it to it, which is p to the number of open edges, 1 minus p to the number of closed edges. And then you have a parameter q, which is just a number. And you put it to the number of connected components. So here in this picture, we have one connected component here, one here, one here, one here. And also you have these four dots, blue dots, that are connected components. So this, this uh, sort of uh, image, this sort of uh, measure was introduced in the 70s by Fortune and Castellane. It's called uh, FK percolation or the random cluster model. If you set Q equals to one, you will notice that what the weight here is just P one minus P to the number of open and closed edges and you get Bernoulli percolation. But what we'll do is we'll take P usually greater than one and we'll try to study for different values of Q which are greater than one. You can also take it smaller than one but there's a reason why things get really difficult then. Okay. Now, this is very common in physics. If you want to have a, a probability measure that has this sort of weights, well, if you sum them up, they should be one, and they're not. So what you're going to do is you're going to sum all of this for all the possible configurations and call a, the partition function this sum and divide the weight by the partition function. Like this, you get weights that sum up to one. And this is indeed a probability measure. OK. Um, we will generally want to look at infinite systems. And this you can't define directly on an infinite graph, except when q is equal to 1, simply because all of these quantities are going to be infinite. So what we'll do is we'll define it on finite graphs and then kind of take the finite graphs to be very large or take them to infinity. So you could think of this as being part of the infinite lattice. And then what you might want to think about is what happens to these clusters outside of the box, of this box here. And what can happen to say, extreme things that can happen is that they're completely disconnected. There's nothing connecting them outside, in which case you would count them as we just did. But you could also think that they're all connected outside, in which case all the clusters here touching the boundary, these ones, you'll count them as one. And in this picture now, there's one, two, three, four clusters. Okay? So you can count clusters like this, and then we will put a zero up here, and we'll call this the free boundary condition measure. 
Or you can count them as one big cluster, and we'll put here one and call this the uh, wired boundary condition measure. And this is, this is interesting to do because if you take, uh, if you define these measures on large sets, large subgraphs of Z2, and then take the graphs to infinity, they both converge. The free and the wired converge. And you obtain something called uh, infinite volume limits with free boundary conditions and wired boundary conditions. And it's not clear from the formula, and it's maybe even a bit hard to prove, but um, the one with free boundary condition is always smaller than the one with wired, meaning there will be more open edges here than here. And what's more, I mean, they could be equal, but they could also be different generally. What's more, what you notice is that as you increase P, Q will always think about it as fixed, and you play with P like you do for percolation, and, and as you increase P, these measures increase. More, you could imagine you see a movie and you're increasing P and more open edges appear. So if you think about percolation as well and you do to have a par parallel with it, you do expect that as you increase P, at some point you will see an infinite component arising. So, and, and we do expect that you see this abruptly. And actually this is what Vincent is gonna show in the next lecture and this whatever that I mentioned. So what do we expect to see? We, we expect to see a subcritical phase when there's a no infinite cluster and a supercritical phase where there is infinite cluster. And what is the whole point of the lectures, if you wish, is to show that these phases are really just separated by a single point. I mean, that's, if you look at the picture like this, of course it is a, just a single point if you believe in the fact that this is increasing in P. But what I mean as a single point is that this phase here behaves kind of trivially. If you look from very far away, what you're gonna see is not very interesting in terms of connections. Why? Well, because if you take a big box like this, say size 200 or something, and P is just below PC, then even the largest clusters, which I've colored here in blue or red just so that you can see them, are small. And actually, if you zoom out and look at the larger and larger picture, they are gonna become smaller and smaller and you're, you're not gonna see them at the end. So everything is gonna look disconnected on large scale. And on the other side here, what you're gonna see is that you're gonna see a big, big, big cluster and small holes in it. And as you zoom out, everything will be in the big cluster. The holes are gonna become infinitesimal. So the question is, how do you transition? This is the question that we're asking ourselves. But as is illustrated in the lectures, even showing that you transition at a single point is something that is, was hard to prove. And it's just now that we managed to prove it. Uh, and actually, for, for the model in 2D, the first proof came in 2012. And it also identified the critical point as being square root of Q over one plus square root of Q. And then this, uh, this new technique that uh, you see in the lectures is proving it in any dimension. So let me just also comment very briefly. The fact that once you know that there's a single point, you can also find the value, this isn't surprising at all in two dimensions. And the reason is that you have this duality relations that we've also seen for percolation in the first lectures. So they exist here as well. If you know that there's a single point where you transition, then it must be the self-dual point. So f guessing where it is is not hard generally. If, if there's a duality relation. Okay, so what can ha happen at PC? There are two possibilities that can, uh, you can have at PC. One is called having a continuous phase transition and one a discontinuous phase transition. And you can, I'll illustrate this by looking at the quanti the, this quantity here, the theta of P, probability to be in an infinite component. So this one is increasing and it's zero under PC and what you could think is, is it continuous or is it discontinuous? Turns out it can only be discontinuous at PC. So these are the two possibilities and we're gonna call this a continuous phase transition and this a discontinuous phase transition. And I'm, I'm quoting another paper here from 2015 I think but maybe it appeared even later. It was actually done probably here or part of it was done in this institute by uh, Hugo, uh, Vincent, and Vlada Sidohavicius, who proved that basically you're in either this picture or this one. Now this, if you look at the pictures, you're gonna say it's not a very deep theorem, right? It's kind of clear that you're in either one or the other. But what they proved is that basically this behaves in a specific way and there are many, many equivalent characterizations of this picture and this behaves in a specific way and there are many characterizations of this. 
in particular, basically all quantities that you can look at are going to be continuous here and discontinuous here, etc. And so I, I'm giving here a few of these characterizations. And what it says is that if you're in the continuous phase transition, you behave basically like the phase transition of percolation. And most notably, you have what's called RSW uh, relations. Crossing boxes has bounded probability uh, bounded above and below. If you're here, it's as if the, phase, the critical phase is missing and you jump straight from subcritical to supercritical. What they've also proved is that this case here happens when Q is between one and four. This is using uh, this parafermionic observable that you might have heard of. Um, and it's actually using this dichotomy. It's showing that you can't have exponential decay and therefore you need to be here. And it's been a conjecture that what you see when Q is larger than four is this, uh, this regime. This was a quite long standing conjecture. I think it's from the 80s maybe at, at least. It appears in physics literature, but generally what happens in physics is that uh, physicists are usually very, very good at computations and then doing equivalences between models. They kind of compute something, it indicates a transition of this sort, and then they say, okay, it goes through. But it, all this, it indicates and it goes through and everything is hard to usually formalize. So our result is, is proving this. And therefore, a lim uh, 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 kind of finding all cases for Q uh, above one. And I'm gonna illustrate again what it means to be in this case or this case. So if you're in this case, you see this as P is smaller than PC, you see this when P is larger than PC, but when you approach PC, there's a like really spot, one single point where something completely different happens. And what you see is this. This is something that if you would now zoom out, imagine you're, you have your field of connected things and you zoom out, here you're gonna see tri trivial things, nothing is connected. Here you're gonna see trivial things, everything is connected. Here what you're gonna see is you see this blue component, you're gonna see it become smaller and disappear, but in the, at the same time other bigger components will come into your picture. So you zoom out and your picture gets bigger and you'll see other ones. And these ones will become small and disappear, but other ones will, become, will come. And they all will, will have the same fractal shapes, obviously random, but the same type of fractal shapes. This is what's called scaling variant. Okay, this picture is supposed to exhibit a lot of very interesting uh, behavior, which I'm not gonna talk about, because when you're in this phase here, this just simply doesn't exist. What does that mean? It means that as you approach from the left, from P smaller, the value PC, you're gonna see this, and you're gonna see it up to PC. As you approach from the right, you're gonna see this. And you might ask, how is that possible? Like, what happens at PC? If you, know, you can't be simultaneously in this and in this, they're contradictory to each other. What happens at PC is that you have two, two measures, and actually more measures, any interpolation between the two. So what happens is the free and wired boundary conditions are, give you separate measures, the free one is the limit as you approach from the left and will look like this, and will share all the properties of subcritical phases, most notably exponential decay of, uh, of connections. And phi one is gonna be like this, and it's gonna uh, have all the properties of supercritical, namely an infinite cluster unique with exponentially small islands of disconnected parts of it. So this is what we're trying to prove. We're trying to prove that at the critical point, these two are different and that the free and wired cannot coexist. Okay. Yes, yeah, I think you do know that. I uh, don't have the reference in mind now. I think it's maybe this work with Velenik. Huh? It's th that's what they prove? Yeah, that's why, I, no, I think it's uh, Hugo and uh, Velenik and, yeah, but maybe it's only for integer Q. So I think it, it should be true, integer Q almost certain, generally it can't be completely certain. We, we can talk about it. Sorry? Uh, I think this is actually percolation, but. <laughs> Uh, 
accident. Ac this isn't a, sim a correct simulation, it's just me trying to illustrate. I'm very bad at simulation. So th these are, I think, just percolation configuration, if I remember correctly. So it's not, uh, it's not Q greater than one. But the e if you would really be very good at it, you would notice that the fractal behavior, the fractal dimension of that middle picture is that of percolation. Anyway, so all of this was actually to paint a picture of what we want to do. None of these results, even the criticality, is not going to be used by us because we'll just very brutally compute the speed of exponential decay in this, in this measure here. So our theorem is this. If Q is larger than 4, then this event here, the probability to have a primal path that goes from 0 to the outer boundary of the box of size n, this theta n, decreases exponentially. And maybe I should also talk a little bit about this. I don't know how familiar you are with these sort of models, but when you look at this, you're going to take this limit of minus 1 over n log of this thing. Uh, why do you take that? Well, because this limit is, you, you should see it like this. This decreases exponentially like minus n over something. This is called a correlation length um, or, yeah, or characteristic length. It, it's called, it's a length and you write it as such because what you, you should imagine is every time you want to go this much further, it's going to cost you an, uh, a factor of e. So you decrease exponentially kind of on this length scale. And what you, your, the question is, is this one uh, strictly smaller than infinity or not? That's the question. And what we prove is that we compute it and we just show that it's strictly smaller than infinity. Well, one over it is strictly greater than zero. That's the question. It always exists, but it can be zero. So, so you compute it, you know the asymptotics is Q10 to four, et cetera. All right, okay, so how do we do this? Um, oh yeah, maybe I should just go and explain what this is. So the random cluster model is very linked to the POTS model. POTS model is a coloring of the vertices in Q colors with a certain energy. It's very similar to the easing model, but with more than one sp oh, than two spins. So what is these simulations are the POTS model with two, three, four, five, six, no, five, six, nine colors at the critical point with blue on the outside. So what you notice is immediately that for Q equals two, three, four. There's this exact, this, this type of coexistence of the different colors. And at five or more, one color beats the other. The boundary conditions, even if they're quite far somehow, they influence all the spins in the box. So this is exactly what we're proving. We're, we're, we're proving the bottom row of this picture. Okay, so as I said, physicists are very good at um, at uh, having relations between models. And it's been noticed that the random cluster model has a very tight relation with the six vertex model. Six vertex model is itself very studied. It's a spin glass model. And well, it's called like this because of these six vertices that are possible. Now let's very briefly explain what it is. So, let's start like this. What you'll do is you'll take a graph, a, a sub part of Z2, and uh, you'll orient edges, in either left or right or up or down. And you're gonna have a rule, which is that at each vertex, you want to have two vertices, two edges coming in, two arrows coming in, and two going out, okay? And this, uh, if you look at the vertices, these, this leaves six possibilities for the vertices which are listed here, and you're gonna, assign a weight to any configuration, which is the product of the weight of each vertex, and the weights are A for these two, B for these two, and C for these two. See, the C ones are a bit different from these ones, because they have the opposing edges being uh, different. The, yeah. okay, and these ones. Um, so you could imagine trying to assign in, uh, in uh, New York uh, direction or or in Ipanema, a direction for each street, one-way street. Um, okay, so you do this, and, um, and then you can do the same thing. You can put, do a, a probability uh, measure on graphs by taking the sum over all possibilities, that's okay. Now we're gonna look at this model because 
uh, the relation to our model is for a b equals one and c greater than two. So we have that in mind. And we'll do it on a torus uh, with n and height m. And you should imagine m being larger than n somehow, but, and both of them notch. And when I say on a torus, it simply so it means that the configuration must be such that uh, the right-hand side is equal to the left-hand side and the bottom side is equal to the top side. So if I would ask you what's the weight of this configuration, what you should say is, well, it's c to the number of vertices of this sort, and you can count them here, and you kind of see them here, okay? Um, there's one thing that maybe I should mention as well, is that if you look at this picture and you try to draw a few pictures, the fact that we imposed here that the left and right boundary are the same imposes that the number of up arrows on every row is gonna be the same one. So you, this is something that you should check by hand, but it, it, it's true. So here, for instance, the number of up arrows on each row is one, two, three, four. And you can check that it's four on every row. Otherwise, this, this condition would be violated. Okay, so we're gonna study this model. And I'm claiming that it's related to the six vertex, uh, to the random cluster model, and it could be interesting to some of you just to, for instance, see this bijection. Well, it's not this correspondence. Maybe if you, the rest of the talk is uninteresting, this could be interesting to you. So what I'm gonna first say is how uh, you go from one configuration to the other, and then we'll look at the weights. Generally what you want is you want some correspondence between the configurations, and that it carries through to the weight somehow. Okay, so the random cluster is gonna be on this graph here, so it's on a square lattice but tilted by 45 degrees, and the, the um, six vertex on this one, which is obtained from this just by placing uh, here um, vertices and drawing the lines like this. It's called the medial graph of this one. And here I've drawn in red, I think, the n random cluster, and in blue, if you remember what the dual is. So it's just the thing separating the, well, here's a configuration. The red is the random cluster configuration, and the blue is the, well, you see it. It's just the fences between the reds. Okay, this is the dual configuration. All right, we draw this. Now what we do is we're gonna draw uh, yellow loops that separate the red from the blue, like this. The yellow is called a loop configuration. So you can, in, instead of say, seeing this picture, if you prefer loops and this, you can look at this picture. Then what we'll do is we'll orient each loop in one direction or another, and you'll obtain a bunch of oriented loops. By the way, the fact that these are loops is because you're on the torus and you can just check it that it, it's indeed a collection of loops on the torus. So here you obtain a bunch of oriented loops. And if you look at this, each, or each edge of this lattice is in one of the loops and therefore has an orientation and you can just check, forget about the loops, just keep the orientation of each edge. We could check if this is, a, this is indeed a six vertex configuration. Well, if you think about it, at each vertex, what happens, you have th two loops going through it each goes in once, goes out once, therefore you indeed have two ingoing, two outgoing edges. Okay, so at least it's a six vertex configuration. It might be not clear that this is a bijection or that you obtain everything from everything, but okay. Let's now look at the weights. So this is gonna be a bit, maybe th there's a bit of computation, but I, I recall here that the weight in a configuration like this is p to the number of open edges, one minus p to the number of closed edges, and q to the number of clusters. And what we'll do is we'll now fix p equals p, uh, the self-dual value, this magical value here. And you'll see immediately why. Now, uh, I wanna simplify this a bit. I'll put uh, one minus p in factor to the number of edges and get just p over one minus p to the number of open set, uh, open edges, and this p over one minus p, if you look at this particular value, is just square root of q. So uh, you can rewrite this. Basically, this, you should always think of this, this is a constant that does not depend on the configuration, then therefore you can just forget about it. So already what we see is we like this value of p because we get a weight that just depends on the loops and somehow d does not distinguish between red and blue which is the sign of self-duality. Means that the red and the blue play the same role, actually. Okay, and furthermore, now comes the nicer part, say. 
we are on a plane, and in the plane, the, the number of loops, clusters, open edges are all related. And the relation that you can see is that two times the number of clusters plus the number of open edges is equal to the number of loops plus the number of vertices plus some little thing here that maybe I can write down so that you know, if you ever forget what it is, you can remember. S of omega is just values 0 and 1, and it's the indicator of having something like this having a loop that goes around the torus in this direction and also around the torus in this, uh, sorry, not a loop, but a connected component that goes around the torus in both directions. Okay. Anyway, it's something that's value zero or one. It's completely uh, unimportant here. Okay, so if I re delete this and put this in, what I get is constant that does not depend on the configuration, square root of q to the number of loops plus this little s here that we don't want to care about. Okay, so it's just a c that depends on the graph times this, this part here. Okay, so let's keep that in mind and now um, try to go and somehow relate it to the weights here. So what, we, what we'll do is we'll uh, associate to each um, configuration here a weight, I'm defining it, as being exponential of the total winding of all the loops so the winding is just you take a loop and you go around it and see how much it winds around. So you can see that the total winding of a loop that goes like this in this direction is minus 2 pi. And the winding of a loop that goes in this direction, it's plus 2 pi. It's just that it's going to seeing it as a winding is going to come out nicely. So what I'll associate to this uh, weight here is just total winding times lambda over 2 pi, where lambda is this number here. Okay, so why do I do that? Well, because what you'll see is that um, e to the lambda plus e to the minus lambda is equal to square root of q. Okay, this is how I chose lambda. And I like this y because this means that if I orient the loop, one loop like this, it will give me this much. And the same loop, if I orient it like this, it's going to give me this much. So as I sum over all the orientations, each loop appears like this once, like this once. And therefore, its total contribution will be exactly square root of q. Yes? I'll get to that. <laughs> okay, so th therefore, what you get is, I mean, maybe you should, if you, you're not convinced, you should sit down and kind of work through it. But the square root of q to the number of loops is basically this sum. This is over all the possible orientation of the loops. Now, as Sasha very well uh, observed, it's, it's not really entirely true because you have these weird loops that don't have orientation to plus or minus 2 pi which are those that go around the torus like this, or vertically. These ones don't have orientation plus or minus, but they always have orientation uh, winding zero. So okay, you have also this little term to take care of, and that's why we have this term of, for these loops here. But imagine all these terms as being irrelevant. This is important. So this is over all the possible orientations. Okay, so we link this to this. Now let's link this to this. Um, you already saw probably that this, this isn't bijective. Somehow from here you go to here, it's, bi it's bijective. But from here to here, you have many configurations here that correspond to one here. So if you want to see it in terms of injective maps, you should start here, go towards the left. Start here goes towards the right. Because when you go towards the right here, you erase what happens at different corners. And so you lose some information. So again, here, the map from here to here is surjective but not injective. From here to here, surjective but not injective. Okay, so let me explain now from here to here how you go. Okay, so uh, if you have here a configuration, then, uh, and you want to retrieve this one, then you'll notice that if the vertex is of type one, two, three, or four, there's just one way to get back to the loops. But if you have a vertex of type five or six, well, you can either choose to go like this through it, like this here, 
or like this. And same for a six vertex, you can go like this through it and like this. So you'll need to, as you go from this picture to this one, you have to sum over all the possible choices for vertices of type five and vertices of type six. So again, you do this kind of summing over all the choices. And what I'll do now is I'll take C to be equal to E to the lambda over two plus E to the minus lambda over two, which is equal to this quantity here, which is greater than two is if Q is greater than four. And why do I do that? Well, because if I wanna count the winding of this picture here, one way is to sum over all the loops, the winding of each loop. But another way, which is much more interesting and more local, is to look at each vertex and sum the winding of each vertex. So let's kind of try to do that on this few vertices here. What's the winding of this vertex here? Well, this guy has a pi over two turn, and this guy does a minus pi over two turn. So this vertex here is gonna have zero contribution to the total winding. So as this one, as this one, as this one. However, this vertex here will have contribution plus pi, this one minus pi. This one plus pi, this one minus pi. So as you go back from the six vertex configuration to the loop configuration, each vertex of type five or six will half of the time contribute plus pi to the winding and half of the time minus pi to the winding. So to the weight, it will contribute half of the time this much, half of the time this much. And so as you, if you do the summing over all of them, you'll indeed get C. So what I claim by all of this is for any six vertex configuration, its weight is equal to the weight of all the co all the loop configurations which are coherent with it. Okay. So we have these two relations here. And these ones, I mean, as I said, it's not a, it's a, it's a relation between models. It kind of looks promising. So maybe not clear what it gives you. But what you can do, for instance, if you, is you can just replace this, like put these sums to be equal and I mean, sum over all the possible omega here or some of their possible, all the possible omega here, say that the two are equal. Yep. Yes, yes. So if Q is smaller than four, you have the same correspondence, you'll run into some, I can't remember where, here. Here you'll run into some complex numbers, lambda will be complex, but if you just look at weights, you can do it. So you do, can do this, that's not where the, somehow the thing fails when Q equals four. I'll explain why it fails. Okay. So let's, uh, what, what could we get out of this? Well, we could, for instance, do the sum over all of the possible configurations, and we would get something like this. The sum over all possible weights of the random cluster is equal to the sum over all possible weights of the six vertex. With this constant C in front that depends on the graph, and with these minor corrections here that come from the fact that the loops are hum how some not, somehow not very well behaved. Okay, and this, this is already, m can be interesting. It's, uh, it's a relation between the partition functions. It can give you, for instance, a relation between the, what's called the free energy uh, uh, of, the, of the two models. But we're interested in probabilities, and if you wanna look at probabilities of things, you, one of these things is never enough. You need to do ratios of things like these. You wanna do the ratio of the sum of all the things, this is Z, and above you need to have the ratio of the uh, omegas that somehow are of the sort that you're looking at. So in the next slide, I'll try to convince you of the, um, of the event that we wanna look at and try to see how you can relate it. By the way, uh, if there are any questions at any point, Feel free to ask. Okay. So, let's um, kind of put these things aside now and try to understand what it means to be at a critical phase, but in this first order phase transition, this discontinuous phase transition. So, you, you have already seen that since we are at the self-dual point, the blue and the red, the primal and the dual connections play the same role. If you look on the torus, there's no reason to think that you're more inclined to be red than blue. So you're not gonna be able to say, well, I take a torus, I look at the probability of having a blue connection and it just decreases exponentially. It's not gonna happen because they're, they're balanced, the two of them. So how do you guess that you're in, a, you're in the first order phase transition? 
what you need to see is that the coexistence of red and blue is very, very unlikely. You should always imagine as red and blue being equally possible, but when your Q group smaller than four, they kind of not like each other, but they stand each other, so they can coexist with big bunches of blue, big bunches of red. When Q is greater than four, they really hate each other, and one of them always conquers the other one. Half of the time it's red, half of the time it's blue. So therefore, if you ask that you have big blue connections and at the same time big red connections, this is going to be very, very unlikely. And this is the event that we're going to look at. And what you expect is that, just going to kind of briefly ex try to explain, um, the probability of having a loop that winds vertically around the torus, which is blue, and at the same time one which is red on the torus, um, as, as the height goes to infinity, you expect it to decrease exponentially fast. But the question is how fast do you actually expect it to decrease? And you expect it to decrease exponentially fast with this thing here that as once you took m to infinity, then you take n to infinity, it goes to the correlation length. So this is a fact that you prove within the random cluster model. Doesn't, the correlation length can be zero or not. It's all, this is always more or less true. I th kind of. Okay, so we think that this is true. Okay, so let's estimate this sort of probability. And you will notice that we just want to estimate how fast in exponential scales it goes. So we need a very rough estimate on it. Okay, so this probability is the ratio of the partition function at the bottom and configurations such as this one at the top. The partition function at the bottom it's more or less this. If we ignore these terms, it's kind of like the partition function of the six vertex model. What happens with, the, with weights of events such as this one? Well, if you have, so let's loop, look at the loop configuration when you have a blue path and a red path. If you have a blue path and a red path, which are big, then you need to have a big loop, actually two of them. Because the blue and the red are separated by big loops, so there should be a big loop here going from the top to the bottom and another one on the other side that goes through here as well. It's on the torus. Okay, so now let's orient these loops. You remember each of them is oriented in one direction or the other. So maybe one fourth of the time, both of these loops are oriented towards the bottom. Okay, well if that is the case, how many up arrows are on each row? So let's look. Are there more up arrows, more down arrows? What happens? Well, each of these small loops here, if you look at it on, a, on one single row, it will contribute as many times up as it contributes down, however it is oriented. The only ones that could impose an um, unbalance in the number of up and down arrows are these ones. And if these two are oriented downwards, well, this line here is going to have one more uh, two more down arrows than it has up arrows. So it will have an excess of down arrows and a deficiency of up arrows. And as I said, all rows have the same number. So what you're going to be, and, and you can go through and compute this, and what happens is that the, the sum of all the weights over the event that you have these red and blue paths is comparable to the partition function of the six vertex model, where instead of summing all the weights, you sum just the weights which have n over two minus one up arrows on each row. And it turns out that it's really costly to have too few up arrows, one less than half. It's really gonna cost you much in terms of weight. This, this is gonna be much smaller than the total. Okay, so, um, so the conclusion is that up to some small factors here that constant factors, the probabil this probability in terms of six vertex can be expressed as the partition function where you have n over two minus one up arrows on each row over the whole partition function. And actually the whole partition function, most of its weight comes from the scenarios, so from the configurations where you have half up arrows, half down arrows on each row. So you wanna look at the partition function with n, minus n over two minus one up arrows on each row over the partition function with n over two exactly up arrows on each row. Then it's gonna be even. Have five minutes, is that it, or how much? Sorry. Oh, okay. 
Okay, so so this this is this correspondence between the models was one block of of the talk that may be interesting to you. Um, to us, this was more or less known when we even started this. So it's not it's not new ideas. It's not uh, revolutionary. Um, the really new or yeah, I'd say the, the really new thing and the, the, the difficult part of the, the paper was to actually estimate these things. So what I propose now is that I kind of tell you briefly of a completely different topic that we will use to estimate this. I'm not going to tell you exactly how we actually did it because it gets very technical. Okay, so the six vertex model and the, part, the transfer matrix te technique. So I'll try to explain this to you. So the transfer matrix, you might have heard the word, is uh, an object that appears in many statistical physics models. It's a way to compute these partition functions using matrix theory and then th these matrices, you could maybe look at them and understand their spectrum. It's, um, it, okay, it goes like this. Suppose I give you a, a bunch of app a row like this of up and down arrows and an above row of up and down arrows on say a torus or a cylinder. And I'm asking, and I ask you, can you complete this line here on, on the cylinder with uh, horizontal arrows in, so as to obey this rule, this six vertex rule? And if so, in how many ways? And actually, what is the total weight of all the possible completions of this horizontal thing? This, you can sit down and try to do it, and it turns out that you can really do it well and understand when there are completions, etc. And I'm not at all gonna try to convince you how it is, but here's the explicit formula. I'll call V1 uh, Psi 1 Psi 2, uh, sorry, V Psi 1 Psi 2, the weight of all the possible completion if you call Psi 1 the bottom and Psi 2 the top row. And it turns out that there's a special case. If psi 1 is equal to psi 2, then there are two possible completions which have each weight 1. In a certain case, there's c to the number of arrows which are different than the top and at the bottom if there are such completions. And actually, there's just one. And there are a lot of cases in this uh, v that are 0 because there's no possible completion. And in particular, what you should un uh, keep in mind is that if the number of up arrows on this row and on this row are different, then there's no possible completion. This is what I mentioned before, that there's a conservation of the number of up arrows on all the rows. Okay, so we understand this, how, how this looks. Why is this interesting? Well, because what I could do is I could say, let me look at the total weight of all the possible configurations on this cylinder or on the stores. I could impose first the, all the vertical arrows, and then I could sum over all the possibilities on the horizontal arrows. So what do I get out of it? Well, on the first line I get V Psi 1 Psi 2, on the second line I get V Psi 2 Psi 3, etc. What you notice is that this looks like a matrix product, especially that then Okay, let, let me just explain what this is. If we're on a torus, there's also some uh, interaction between the top line and the bottom line, so I also get a V Psi M Psi uh, 1. And this, if I now want to find out the total partition function, what I need to do is also sum over all the possibilities for Psi 1, all the possibilities for Psi 2, etc. So when I do this, I get something like this, and you see that this looks like a ma matrix product. If you imagine V as a matrix, it's like a matrix product. Okay, so you, as you sum over all but Psi 1, you get this, V to the power M Psi 1 Psi 1, Gordon. You sum over all the Psi 1s and you get the trace of the matrix to the power M. Okay. So this, this matrix, it's important to see it's, it's a, if N is here the width of this torus or cylinder, it's a matrix that has coordinate 2 to the M over 2 to the M coordinates. It's like it's indexed, each of its coordinates is indexed by all possible ways of placing up and down arrows. So you could say, well, it's a huge, huge matrix. I mean, what's the point of trying to find a spectrum of a, or trying to find a trace of a huge matrix like this 
why don't I just try to compute directly the thing? Well, it turns out that the matrix can be, you can study it in nicer ways. So, okay, perfect. So let me uh, now explain a little bit how this matrix looks and try to get to the end of it. Okay, so this matrix, as I said, has a lot of zeros. And if you remember, uh, things that have different number of up and up arrows on different rows, anyway, they have zero matrix element between them. So it's a matrix that's gonna have blocks like this. Each of this block, blocks corresponds to the interaction of vectors with these many up arrows on each row. Okay, so already you can understand that uh, it's, it's split into blocks. And actually each of the blocks has uh, positive or zero entries, but it's irreducible, so there, therefore the peron frobenius theorem applies to it, and it has one big eigenvalue. And if you think about the matrix to, to a very large power, it's only the big eigenvalues that play a role. So with this trace, it's gonna be controlled by the leading eigenvalue of each block. And if you wanna look at uh, the partition function over um, configurations with k up arrows on each row, well, this is the, it's as before you can check, but it's the trace of the block here index k to the power m. And if you write it in terms of eigenvalues, all of these are small. Remember that you take m to infinity, n is fixed, so this is a fixed matrix, very large but fixed. You take m to infinity, so if these, this guy here is bigger than all of the others, and the sum is finite, then it's just this that counts, so it's just this. And really to a very good order, like exponentially good order. So, so the whole point now is to kind of try to estimate these peron frobenius eigenvalues. So there's one eigenvalue of a big matrix to compute, and if you manage to understand that, you really manage to understand everything. And uh, for instance, let me explain what you, the th kind of things that you can get. Uh, the free energy, which is just kind of, you take the partition function, and you take the logarithm and divide it by the number of vertices, the energy, the average energy brought by each vertex, it's this, and you know you can. It turns out that you can just look at the main block of the ma uh, of the matrix, and I if you look at it, it just becomes the first asymptotic of this largest eigenvalue. Which the eigenvalue depends on n, and it turns out that we can actually compute estimate these. And here's the explicit formula for the free energy, which is interesting to find. If you look at this probability, this is what uh, we we're looking for. Well, we said that it's the same as computing the, the um, trace of the second, well, the partition function of these guys with n over two minus one up arrows over the total partition function. Take the log, take m to infinity, and say that each of these is controlled by the larger, largest eigenvalue in their blocks, and you find this limit of eigenvalues. And so the whole, the whole thing then becomes try to find out how these behave as capital N tends to infinity. As the, the size of the matrix goes to infinity, how these are large eigenvalues behave. And you, maybe you will notice here that this guy here is somehow a first order estimate for the largest eigenvalue. This is a finer estimate. It's kind of a second order estimate for these large eigenvalues that we need. But it turned, we, we managed to compute this. So okay, I'm uh, gonna give you one more slide to see what you've escaped. Uh, and also to mention some th something interesting. So um, the way you can, have, if you have such large matrices, and if these matrices have a certain structures, structure, uh, there's a very useful and powerful tool to guess eigenvalues, which is called the beta ansatz. Uh, it was completely new to us when we started this project. We learned about it. We surely learned badly about it. I don't think we understand it the way it should be understood. But I, to me, it was, I, I heard about it many times and I never knew exactly what it actually means. So let me just show you how the beta ansatz looks. So, whoop. first of all, there's a lot of notation. You index, what you do is you take this matrix and the way you index its entries is that by the position x1 up to xn of the up arrows on, on each row. Then there are some functions here defined, which are 
inessential to if you just want to look at the thing. And what it tells you is this. This is the theorem. This is the beta ansatz. It tells you that if you can find some p1 up to pn, some numbers which satisfy a horribly complicated equation here, then you've got a vector which has a um, explicit but horribly complicated expression and an eigen and a value which has, again, an explicit but pretty horribly complicated expression. And you have v psi equals lambda psi. So this looks like you have an eigenvector, right? So th this is just com combinatorics. You kind of, I mean, as, as much as we can see, kind of put it in, start checking, and you know, check and check and check and check all these. Th these here, you have sum over permutations here, and check all the permutations and so on, and it just works out, and you find this equality. Um, you, you don't even, for instance, know that psi is different from zero, so you don't know if it's an eigenvector actually. But you can show it. I mean, in certain cases. We managed to show it, more or less. Uh, you don't know if this eigenvalue is interesting to you. You don't know if it's the largest one. But the Perron Frobenius eigenvalues have certain properties, such as that the vector is the only vector that has only positive entries. So it, it has nice properties, and maybe you managed to. And this is absolutely unbelievable to me how, the phys how in physics and in the beta ansatz community, there exists an understanding of what you should choose here, exactly which solutions of this function of this equation, which by the way, it's not trivial that has solutions, or that they're unique, but which solutions you should put in in order to obtain the largest eigenvector. What we did is we worked really hard to try to understand that there are solutions here and that they give you something and that this thing is the Baron Frobenius eigenvector. Once you get that, if you understand the solutions here well enough, then you can estimate from, from these expressions. You can estimate what, how the logarithm of these eigenvalues behave, and you can get those asymptotics that, that we got first. Okay, so I guess I'm gonna stop. Just, I hope that people understood that there are a lot of different tools, and you know, each of these blocks is very interesting by itself, at least in my opinion. I find them very beautiful. Um, well, maybe except this. <laughs> Which is not so beautiful. But if you understand it properly, it's interesting as well.